Um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Laura. I'm the program officer of the Columbia Global Center. And um, this is our sixth online webinar. Uh, we have been working on this uh, online meetings um, since we are dealing with unprecedented times. Uh, this is our, our uh, chance to connect Columbia experts and local experts with uh, the work that we have been doing here in Brazil. Um, I wanted to let you know that if you want to make any questions, please send it, your question through the uh, chat area below. I'll make sure to address a few of them by the end. Uh, well, where we are going to have a, a, a time for Q and A. Um, I'm handing now to Thomas, our director. Tom. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Trebut of the Columbia Global Center in Rio. Um, as you know, uh, it, it public. Uh, it, public health professionals have long labored among us, but rarely have they been such a center of attention, have they realized how much we depend upon public health and epidemiology, take it for granted in between pandemics, but certainly that's not the case any longer. Columbia has uh, fine scientists and researchers looking at all dimensions of this health crisis, which are multiple and seem to be unfolding. In different dimensions seem to be revealed daily. Uh, we've asked uh, Professor Wafal Sadar of uh, the Columbia Millman School of Public Health uh, and, and Professor Sylvia Martins to be with us tonight. Welcome, professors, very much. Professor Wafal Sadar uh, has generously agreed. She's one of the most generous Columbia faculty sharing her time and expertise to enlighten us all, maybe to aware, make us aware we need to be aware and to put us at ease when we need to be put at ease. Uh, but Professor Wafal Sadr uh, will join us and she'll speak first about the global dimensions of this uh, uh, unfolding disease. What it is we know, Professor Al Sadr, and, and what it is where we still need to know uh, about this uh, insidious virus. After uh, the first session then with Professor Wafal Sadr, we'll turn it over to Professor Sylvia Marchins, also of the Columbia Mailman School. And we're very proud to say one of our not only distinguished member of that school, but one of the distinguished members of our Brazilian faculty at the uh, at Columbia University. And Sylvia will add whatever she really wants to add, but we'll focus much more on the situation from her point of view here in Brazil. And after that, as Laura says, we'll open up for question and answers. So I, I've given each uh, of our uh, experts a, a sort of sense of a direction we'd like to go, but I think it all comes down to please update us on the spread of this disease. Where are the hot spots? Uh, where are the glimmers of hope? Uh, what is it we know and what is it we don't know uh, about this unfolding uh, disaster? We'll turn first to Professor Al Sadr. Wafa, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you. I'm sharing my slides here for a second. Just give me a minute. Um, Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with all of you today, and particularly to share this webinar with Sylvia. It's, a, it's really a great honor to do it together with you, Sylvia. Um, so what I'm going to do is give a global perspective on COVID-19, and then Sylvia will take it on to uh, the, very, uh, to the, to the uh, situation on the ground in Brazil. So just to give you a snapshot on where we're at as of today, uh, so it's estimated that there are, uh, as of today, uh, more than 2.4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, with an estimated 166,000 reported deaths. Of course, there are many people who have recovered, and as you know, the numbers of recoveries always lag the numbers of uh, people who are diagnosed. I think I want to just uh, stop and, and mention one important thing, is that these are the numbers of confirmed cases. And uh, we estimate that actually in reality, probably the numbers of cases is probably double or triple the numbers of confirmed cases because confirmed meaning that that individual has had an actual test for the SARS virus to confirm their case. So you should multiply this number by three or four to get a sense of the magnitude of this uh, global pandemic. By region, the most highly affected uh, part of the world remains in, in, in Europe at this point, 55% of the global cases 
while about a third of the global cases have been reported, uh, confirmed cases reported from the US, and only 3% of the global cases now from China. So clearly the other regions of the world have vastly over, uh, overtaken China in terms of the numbers of cases. If you look at the bottom of the, of the map here on the right, you can see the top five countries in terms of largest numbers of cases are the US, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. Now, what about the evolution of this pandemic? Uh, many of you are aware the very first cases were reported in early, late December, early January in this um, kind of orange color in China. And then over time, the numbers in China have decreased and have remained low, while at the same time, there has been an enormous increase in numbers of cases here in this darker orange and in this yellow. And in yellow are the numbers of cases in the Americas and in this deeper orange here, numbers of cases in Europe. And then you can see in, in purple are the cases in the Eastern, Europe, Eastern Mediterranean. So the epidemic has evolved very quickly over just a few months uh, since it was the, this virus was first discovered uh, in early January of this year. In the U.S., because uh, uh, Columbia University is situated in the U.S., and sad to say is that the U.S. is now the epicenter uh, of this pandemic, with the largest numbers of any country that has reported the confirmed cases, uh, more than 766,000 confirmed cases in the U.S. And within the U.S., the epicenter of the epidemic in the U.S. is in New York City where 17% of the cases, U.S. cases have been reported from New York City. In the U.S., there are every day new cases, there are every day 30,000 new cases that are reported. And to date, there have been 40,000 or almost 41,000 reported deaths in this country, in the U.S. And you can see in the map of the U.S. that clearly in New York, New York, and New York area is one of the hot spots. There are other hot spots around the world in, in the U.S., like for example, Chicago, Detroit, in Florida, in New Orleans, as well as New, in uh, California, L.A., San Francisco, and then in Washington State, particularly the Seattle area. Very quickly in South America, the first cases were report case was reported in February in a traveler from northern Italy. Uh, there have been overall 82,000 uh, case confirmed cases uh, from South America, about 3% of the cases worldwide, uh, and uh, almost 4,000 reported deaths. And you can see the countries here in the order of numbers of cases, confirmed cases they have reported. And Brazil clearly um, has the most, uh, almost 40,000 cases, followed by Peru, Chile, and Ecuador. And on the right here is a graph that I think can show you how alarming the situation is. Uh, you can see in green, in the dark green, this is the growth in terms of the numbers of cases in, in uh, Brazil. And then you can see in the other colors are uh, the other countries that I mentioned before, like Peru here in the darker blue, uh, for example, uh, as well as Ecuador in the brown. But Brazil is by far outpacing the other countries in South America in terms of numbers of the rapidity of growth of numbers of confirmed cases. If we look at the trends by continent, uh, I think this is helpful. So you can see in North America, of course, the US has had this explosion of cases, but there's a hint, an early hint, an, a glimmer of hope, we call it, an early hint of a plateau and maybe a tiny decrease in the numbers of cases over time, uh, but it's too early really to declare victory. And uh, as I mentioned, we're seeing still about 30,000 new cases every day. Again, in Europe, there's also been a plateauing and in, in, it, in Italy now and in Spain, two of the most heavily affected countries, they're reporting smaller numbers of daily cases now. So that's a good sign. On the other hand, if you look at South America, you can see again in the countries uh, here that have had the most burden that, the, the, uh, that these curves are going up and particularly the curve in Brazil. Now, very quickly, how is COVID, this virus, the SARS virus that causes, causes COVID-19, how is it transmitted? And very quickly, there are two ways that it's transmitted. It's person to person. And this happens either through what we call respiratory droplets. This means when somebody sneezes or coughs, there's these droplets of the respiratory secretions that, are that come out of the mouth or the nose, and they contain the virus within them. 
And if somebody is in close contact with somebody who's sneezing or coughing, then that person can inhale those particles and then can get infected. In addition, also, it can be through contact, meaning if, for example, I uh, sneeze in my hand, I touch my desk, and then somebody comes along and touches the desk and then touches their face, or I shake hands with somebody and I've just sneezed in my hand, then that way can also be a way of transmission from person to person. There's also been concern about what we call airborne transmission, meaning just in the air itself, not in these droplets. And I think there's, this has been seen pri primarily, of course, in healthcare settings where there are all these uh, procedures that are done to patients that generate a lot of aerosols. So what do we do when we have an epidemic like we have with COVID-19? There are different phases, epidemic phases, and based on whichever phase the epidemic is at, you actually then match it with the response interventions. So one of the very first uh, important aspects of, of course, tackling an epidemic is to identify it. So actually to do initial uh, preparation to be ready to identify if an epidemic is, an outbreak is gonna start by anticipation and preparedness, very important. And then early detection is very critical. And by early detection, meaning having astute clinicians who keep an eye on unusual cases or clusters of cases, or if you do testing and you identify by testing. So early detection is very, very important. And this is uh, then if you have localized, what we're calling localized transmission, meaning for example, transmission from one case to a household context and so on, we move into what's called the containment mode. And public health, this means, this means that we rapidly have to identify these cases and isolate them. We try trace all of their contacts, their family contacts or household contacts, make sure that all of these contacts are also uh, quarantine as well and watch them all to make sure that they stay isolated or quarantined for the appropriate duration of time. This containment effort is very important, but it's very uh, intensive effort and requires having a very strong and large public health workforce to be able to tackle identifying all the cases and the contacts and doing all this footwork, which is a lot of work. However, what happens sometimes, either because containment is just not feasible or because the virus is transmitted so rapidly, we move into another phase, which is called amplification, where you have very rapid transmission in a community. And in this, when you move into that phase, containment cannot keep up. Simply the numbers are too large and you can't keep up with the numbers and therefore you move from containment to what we call control and mitigation. And in those of the measures uh, that have been described, like for example, uh, social distancing, keeping two meters away from each other, as well as uh, closing the schools, closing the, uh, having people work virtually rather than coming to work uh, in person, as well as uh, stopping any large congregation of people. And the goal behind all of these mitigation efforts is of course to present, to prevent and break these chains of, change of, chains of transmission, which is really the only thing you can do in this phase of an epidemic. Throughout these phases, these early phases though, there are things we can do to prevent transmission. And those are, for example, rapid, uh, very frequently washing hands, never sneezing or coughing in one's hands, as well as of course, staying home as, if one is sick and so on and so forth. If we're successful, then we go into a mode of reducing the transmission and potentially elimination or eradication of the, of the virus itself. Now, very quickly, what is, uh, what is the disease like? And these are data from China. The vast, just to start, is that people usually, if they, they get exposed to a person who's had, who has COVID-19, it takes on average, if they're going to get disease, it takes on average about five days till they develop symptoms, but it could be as short as two days or as long as 14 days, okay? And then very importantly, most people who get the disease have mild to moderate disease. The vast, vast majority have mild to moderate disease. That's very important. And most of these individuals in these green arrows here will recover. So the vast majority who get COVID-19 will recover uneventfully. However, there's a small percentage of people either with severe disease or critical disease that then may have uh, unfortunately progression of the disease and death. 
So I think there's been interesting questions that I've heard a lot of. I've tried to go through them quickly that I want to let you know about is that uh, how early can somebody transmit once they're infected? I think what we know in studies that have been done again in China is early on when you get infected, you have a lot of virus in your secretions and therefore you are most infectious when you're symptomatic early on. As you get better, then the amount of virus in the secretions get lower and lower and therefore the risk of transmission decreases. However, we've also realized now that not only do people start shedding this virus and, and, and spewing this virus in their secretions when they have symptoms, but now we know that it can happen even in people who have no symptoms, meaning they're not coughing and sneezing at all, but they can still transmit to somebody else. And I'll tell you more about this. And this has been an important finding. So there are two phases where transmission can happen. When somebody has symptoms, of course, that's clear they are having symptoms and that's why they're disseminating the viral particles. But also now we know in the pre-symptomatic phase before people develop symptoms that they are shedding the virus as well as also when they actually have no symptoms at all, at all and will not develop the disease, they can also be shedding, unknowingly they can be shedding the virus and potentially transmitting to others. And there have been a lot, I won't go into the details, there have been a lot of data that have shown that these uh, individuals who don't have any symptoms at all, like from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, for example, where it was shown that 18% of people who uh, had no symptoms were shedding the virus, which is alarming, obviously. And other uh, studies have shown even higher, like 30% of people who have no symptoms at all were shedding the virus. Now they're shedding the virus, but is that, are they able to transmit? And the answer is yes. We now have evidence from Singapore uh, that actually transmission has occurred from people before they developed any symptoms. And then we have also another uh, piece of evidence that uh, in a group that was singing in a choir practice in Washington state, uh, nobody was had symptoms at all, but there was transmission uh, uh, from pre-symptomatic people to about 60 choir members. So I think the important thing to keep in mind is you don't have to be sick to be able to transmit. You can unknowingly transmit to somebody else. So very quickly, what are people doing in addition and what they shouldn't do? I think there are people who have seen the surgical, wearing a surgical mask or uh, an N95 mask, which is recommended really only for healthcare workers, should not be used by anyone else, uh, only for healthcare workers. And then there are also the issue of face covering. So the surgical mask is only recommended, it protects, um, it should be worn by patient. So if somebody's diagnosed, should wear that mask, as well as for people who take care of a patient, like in a clinical setting or taking care of someone at home who has COVID-19. Now in the US now, the CDC is recommending that people, everybody, including myself, uh, is to wear a face covering when I'm uh, in public outside or if I'm in a situation where I'm uh, close to somebody, less than two meters away from someone. And the reason that I should be wearing the covering is not to protect myself, is to protect others. Meaning that if I happen to have symptom, without any symptoms, COVID-19, by wearing this face covering, a bandana or a scarf, I will protect others. So this uh, face covering is to protect others, not to protect the wearer of the mask. Uh, very quickly, also some people ask, is someone who's had COVID-19, can they get it again? They're very limited data. That's an important question. But we think that probably they will be protected, that if somebody's had an episode of COVID-19, they probably will be protected from another episode. A small study has shown that both in animals as well as uh, in animal studies in macaques. Uh, but if this is similar to other viruses, we think that usually uh, people develop uh, antibodies and hopefully they will be protected. We don't know for sure, and we also don't know how long this protection would last for. So I think in su summary to this brief intro, uh, COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve. We're learning a lot as it's evolving across the world and as more and more publications and science is shared. The US is most severely affected now uh, with about 30,000 new cases per day, with New York City uh, has the largest number of cases in, 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 the, in the US. And actually, in, in, in many ways, the, the New York City has more cases than any other country around the world except the US. 
Of course, COVID-19 cases continue to rise in South America with the largest number in Brazil. And we're continuing to learn from experiences from other countries. And I think that uh, it's remarkable how much we have learned over the past several months. And I think uh, we're gonna learn moving ahead an enormous amount as well. And it's heartening to see how countries are also learning from each other and learning from each other's mistakes. I always end by saying, uh, in these presentations for COVID-19, stay well, stay strong, and stay connected. Those, Thank you very much. Those are wonderful uh, remarks, uh, Wafa, and a good way uh, to end it. I, I, I know we'll come back uh, in, in uh, the Q&A, maybe talk about things like vaccines and uh, yes. the World mm -hmm. Health Organization and other, other matters. But just for now, if you look around the globe, and if you had to name just one country, um, which country would top your list of being most successful um, in test tracing and isolating or whatever the strategy is? Which one country would you name? <clears throat> well, I think uh, people point to uh, South Korea, for example, as a country that has done quite well uh, because it has it moved very rapidly. The important thing is you can't get this you can't get the epidemic uh, run ahead of you. You have to run ahead of it. And I think one of the important things is South Korea moved very quickly uh, and was able to isolate and quarantine, did the qu containment, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. as well as also use the uh, testing uh, very uh, strategically as well. And so South Korea is one of the success stories. I think another success story, it's maybe too early, but I think Germany is likely going to be another success story where they also move very quickly and put in place very strong mitigation, social distancing measures, as well as also very extensive testing uh, as well in the country. And that's gonna be, I, I anticipate that that's gonna be another uh, success story as well. Thank you very, very much again, Waf. And now uh, we'll come back to you now in the Q&A, but right now I'd like to turn it over to Sylvia to address the situation Waf has mentioned briefly, the extent of the spread of the virus here in Brazil, while we have really few of those resources uh, available uh, to test and trace and, and isolate. And so there's a great deal of worry, even though the country is practicing social distancing, uh, there's a great deal of worry. Uh, could you please address the situation as you see it, uh, uh, Sylvia, here in Brazil? What's the extent of it? What's next for Brazil? <clears throat> well, I think you're still muted, Sylvia. I think you're muted, Sylvia. Yeah. yeah. Muted now? Yeah, I think so. That was good. Yeah, okay. So, well, thank you for inviting me to be part of the seminar and also presenting together with Watha. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the situation, the current situation in Brazil. So, let me just move my slides. So, as of today, as of today, there are almost 40,000 confirmed cases in, in Brazil. And as you see here from the map, most of the cases are largely concentrated in the southeastern region of Brazil, so in Sao Paulo, Rio, but also in the northeast and in the, and in the northern region, particularly, particularly in, in Manaus. Yeah, what is important to mention is that Brazil is not testing widely, even though the country the country has a large public health ser uh, large public health service and uh, it isn't it is testing less per capita less per capita compared to most of the other countries in latin america so there are studies that have been con there is a serological study being conducted in the southernmost state of rio grande do sul by researchers at the university federal university of pelotas in which they did ser a serological study uh, in which they did a serological study and they estimate that the real numbers are actually are actually probably seven times higher than than the current the current numbers of confirmed cases based on based on their serological study that is ongoing and that will be ongoing over the next months. So as you can see here, this is data showing the increase in new confirmed cases per day. So it started in. in Cases started early in late in late February. That was the first confirmed case in Sao Paulo of a businessman that had come from Italy. Then just a few cases trickling on, and as we see, there's still exponential growth up up until now. On the right side of the screen, we see the number of cases and number of confirmed deaths, uh, which are also rising. But again, there is the issue of both cases and deaths not being necessarily not not being necessarily notified and i'll get back to this 
later on in one of the slides. This slide shows the incidence of cases by different states in the country, by different states in the country. So even though most cases, most cases now are, for example, in Sao Paulo, if we look at incident cases by different states, we see we see that the highest incidence incidents are are in the states labeled in red, and that includes that includes states in the northern region of the country, like Amapá and Amazonas, which are also the states, which are also the states with less public health infra infrastructure. So there there are already reports that the the public health care system in Manaus is completely saturated. They they already have patients in all of their in all of their intensive care unit beds, and they're rejecting patients that are gravely ill. They they cannot accept them in into hospitals as of now. So they so the state is running after the virus, trying to increase trying to increase healthcare capacity while it while things while while hospital beds are already taken. And we know that when a patient we know that when a patient is gravely ill usually that patient will stay for a long period, a relatively long period of time in the intensive care unit beds. Then followed by states in the Northeast, Ceará, and then Sao Paulo, Rio, Sao Paulo, Roraima, also in the North, Rio and, and, and the Federal District Brasilia. So those are, those are, the, regions, those are the regions most affected with, with new cases as of now. Again, confirmed cases, yeah. This graph, shows also like the cumulative cases and we're seeing that cases are still growing and also the cumulative number of deaths in the whole country. And, uh, and most importantly, like cases are still growing, uh, a case, new cases are still being confirmed and growing and exponentially growing. And that is related to the fact that contrary to most of the other countries in Latin America, the Brazilian federal government has refused at first to take drastic measures of social, social isolation. So if you see here, like uh, on the map on the left, the, uh, on the map on the left, this is a snapshot on how strict Latin America has been with restrictive measure due to COVID. And that goes like from Argentina, who when they identified the very few first cases, the country and with the country entered into a complete lockdown. Uh, up until like more relaxed countries, including Brazil, in which governors are governors and mayors are taking their own decisions on uh, on trying to implement social distancing, closing schools, close, closing schools, closing universities, closing closing all closing all businesses. But there has been a, a, there hasn't been a unified me message across all states, and also there has been some some backlash from from the federal government. And and, and meanwhile, there ha has there have been like mixed messages given by the president and the health minister. The health minister just changed a few days ago, just, was just changed a few days ago because he was pro pro social stricter social distancing measures. So. It's still unknown how the epidemic will evolve, how the epidemic will evolve while these restrictive measures keep changing and change in different areas of the country. So th this slide sum summarizes what, what measures, what restrictive measures have been taken in Brazil. So schools have been closed, but it's target depending on, on on geographic areas, public events have been closed, but there are reports, for example, of some large mega churches having events with lots of lots of people in some regions of the country, and, and some regions of the country there have, have been efforts, particularly at the state level, to restrict move, movement. Uh, international travel was to high risk regions was banned relatively late, so only by only only late late March, and the, there are still no contact tracing measures. There's still no unified testing policy measures, even though in some states and some cities they are ramping, ramping, ramping up those measures. And the the government is discussing is discussing some some form of relief measures, but they are still not in not not enough. 
this graph shows the community mortality data in, in Brazil. So as of today, the, the graph only shows data up up until up until last week, uh, and I wasn't able to find I wasn't able to find an updated graph earlier today. But as of today, the most updated numbers from the from from the Johns Hopkins Worldwide Tracker reports that there are two thousand two thousand five hundred and seven deaths COVID deaths confirmed uh, uh, confirmed and reported in in Brazil. There are still several others that are still aware the testing hasn't been. Testing hasn't finished, so they're not they're not yet confirmed. Again, mortality data is also concentrated in the same areas where that we see that are the epicenters in the country. So, São Paulo, Rio, Manaus, uh, Manaus, Fortaleza in Sierra, and some other some other cities in in the northeastern part of the country. And but one thing that I'd like to point out is that. There has been an almost 400% increase in hospitalizations for acute respiratory syndrome in Brazil, and most of these cases have not been tested for COVID-10. For COVID-10, so we really don't know if it's due to COVID or due to other, due to COVID or due to or due to other other viruses, uh, other viruses, and I would suspect that a lot of these cases, if tested, would be positive for, for, for COVID. Most of them have not, most of them have not been tested to date. Yeah. This is data specifically on Sao Paulo state, where, which is, which is the epicenter, the epicenter of, of COVID-19 in Brazil. And again, we see an exponential increase across time in number of confirmed cases. They are ramping. They are ramping up uh, testing in the state. Testing in the state as of today, I think they're they're going to start testing 5,000 people a day. But that still needs to be ramped up a little bit more. This also is a graph showing the number number uh, number of deaths specifically specifically in the state. And one thing that I think is important, uh, São Paulo, São Paulo city. São Paulo City has provided a map of deaths by neighborhood, by neighborhood. And even though like if, if we looked at the same map uh, a, a few weeks ago, what we would see is that most, most of the deaths would be largely concentrated in the central areas of the city, which are the richest neighborhoods in the city. Now what we're seeing is that most of the deaths are concentrated in the in the poorer neighbor in the poorer neighborhoods uh, in the poorer neighborhoods that are more that are more widespread and far and far from far from the city center so that is also another problem for the country brazil is a middle income country brazil brazil is a country with a large proportion a large proportion of uh, uh, a large proportion of poor population uh, a lot of a lot of population live live in live in favelas in in slums and and sometimes in, depending on where the person lives even even if they take like all the efforts to practice social distancing it is really hard to do so when when you have to when you have to go out like when you have to go out to to get to 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 work to work to get food for your family so there are some initiatives in some of these slums, both in Sao Paulo and in Rio, where the local community is trying to provide some some space, some space within the community where they would keep people that get ill, and also trying and, and also trying to get to also trying to get all all kinds of help, all kinds of help for for the pop, for the population at the local level. But they're all they're all localized lo, localized initiatives and efforts, and. This is also data that I only found available specifically specifically for Sao Paulo and the governor, both the governor and the mayor of Sao Paulo city have been trying to strictly enforce practicing social distancing. But what we see is that once social distancing started, started, in, started in March, we see that um, the proportion of people practicing social distances increases up to around like up to around almost 60 percent by late by late March by late March but then by by as weeks go by it goes it goes slightly down and, and even go down to last week like to to less than 50 percent of the uh, less than 50 percent of the population and ideally the, the ideally those numbers should be higher should be higher 
for us to be able to flatten the curve in the city and in other areas of the uh, in other other areas of the country, and I, I I would imagine that in some of the others in some of the other areas of the country and some of the other cities these numbers uh, these numbers this proportion is even is even lower than 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 it is in Sao Paulo, particularly particularly like with recent protests that happened in this this weekend and in the past weekend of people really wanting people really asking for things to open for businesses to open for commercial areas to reopen and this being backed up by the federal government so basically that is a snapshot of what is ongoing in brazil and and i i, I would all also say like stay safe and well and try to practice social distancing we hear you uh sylvia and it's so can't we enjoy your presentation very much, but hard to listen to without some sense of alarm. Um, one of the factors that you bring out, which is something that data haven't shown, is a fear that the favela communities, uh, many people living closely together, um, uh, are particularly vulnerable. We're waiting for that wave to hit. Uh, there was some uh, complacency, perhaps, that perhaps they wouldn't be hit because it's not showing up too much in the numbers, but maybe, as you say, it's because we don't have the numbers. We're not, I we're think not it's because we don't have the numbers, yeah. And but you could just have a quick word before we move, move back to uh, uh, Laura with our general questions. The role of Brazilian science in all of this, because despite the fact that the, the president is probably considered the worst possible public leader in, in this pandemic in the world, uh, the Brazilians are practicing social distancing. They're following the lead of governors and, and mayors, and I think they're also listening to the scientists and the scientific community. Do you have any comments on the strength of the of, uh, of the, uh, Brazilian science and all this? What the scientists here are contributing in terms of research, in terms of public messaging, and so forth? Oh, Br Brazil has really strong scientists in in in, in this area in infectious disease and in infectious disease epidemiology. So we know that there are scientists, uh, there are really out, out, outspoken scientists both at, at Pio Cruz, at uh, Federal University of Bahia, at the University of Sao Paulo, and all of them, uh, all of them are really passing the right message to the public. Uh, what I'm concerned is like, are, is everybody truly listening to them? Because there, there is also so much like fake news and, and, and people sending all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of new expert messages via WhatsApp to one another. Like I myself have received like, have received like some, some videos that I, I get appalled when, when I look at them. And then there's also now the debate that chloroquine, chloroquine, oh, hydroxychloroquine would be the cure for the cure for everything. So if you just take it preventive, preventively, preventively, nothing will happen to you. Nothing will happen to you. So I think, I think we have really good, strong scientists in, in Brazil, both infectious disease experts, both infectious disease epidemiologists, and they're trying to they're trying to put the message out there, but that message can be somewhat undermined by by some not just by the government, but also by some celebrities and and people that become celebrity on the day uh, quickly. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Well, I'd I, I like at this point maybe to turn it back. It's been wonderful, these two presentations. We're going a little bit past our, our, uh, our schedule time with them. I don't want to abuse it, but I want to turn it back to you, Laura, there okay. uh, and, uh, to for additional questions that have come to you online. Yeah, I have my first question that is, uh, I think can be for Sylvia or Wafa. Um, my first question is, we understand that the social distance measuring are a way of flattening the curve. But if a country uh, like Brazil is not testing enough, how can the governments work on policies for after the pandemic? So how can the governments know and have data to know how, uh, how can uh, get out of the social distance scenario and start um, and start over again? So uh, how do we work on policies without enough data? It's very hard. I mean, it's it's impossible. I mean, I think in reality, uh, I mean, I think the U.S. has not done well in terms of testing. So um, we also have done uh, not a really good job at all. And you can see by our own epidemic the magnitude, and that's a and that's a a result of a lot of the failures, including the failure of early containment 
um, and then the failure to uh, scale up testing. So I think it's it's absolutely critical because otherwise you're really like the blind leading the blind. There's no way of knowing where you're at in terms of your epidemic curve if you are not detecting cases. I'm very concerned, like Sylvia showed this amazing cur uh, figure with the acute respiratory distress syndrome cases uh, this year versus last year and the enormous increase in numbers of cases. I agree with her. I bet all of these or 90% of them will be COVID-19. So how do you make decisions as to what you're doing now and what you need to do tomorrow if you don't have the information? And you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg if you're just seeing the people who are sick and come to the hospitals. And that was the mistake that was also, that occurred in the US um, and in New York as well. So uh, the data are very critical um, to guide what to do, to, to tell you where you're at in terms of your epidemic curve but even more importantly, to tell you what you need to do next. And I think that's, um, I, can't, uh, hi I can't, you know, highlight enough the importance of testing as well as the importance of public health to be able to actually contain transmission. I mean, we're trying now through the social, uh, social distancing to use some of these measures that are not very precise, uh, you know, while we're um, to be able to decrease the numbers so that at least we can manage through public health to suppress the epidemic completely. Hmm. Yeah, and building upon that, like without without ramping up testing, it will be very very hard to make the, the to make the to make the call on when things can oh, yeah. which policies would work. So I know that in Minas Gerais now they're implementing that if people go out in the streets they should be wearing masks. That also is recommended in some. Uh, uh, that also is recommended in some areas of the country, and, and some other areas of the country. But maybe, like in a country, if, if testing doesn't ramp ramp up, like maybe having good measures of uh, how um, how how. how how busy hospitals are, how busy hospitals are, or might help, might somewhat help. Yeah, uh, if there are still intensive care unit beds, it won't be ideal, but I, I still think like it's still very early for Brazil to relax any social distancing measures that have been implemented in the states and cities that have implemented them. And I would argue yeah, I that even some yeah. cities that haven't implemented them yet should consider implementing them. I mean, I would say 50% social distancing is, is not high enough, as Sylvia has said. And uh, just seeing the curve of cases in Brazil, those are the confirmed cases, you know, <laughs> underestimate just going up like this. This is not the time to loosen or to ease um, these uh, social, these mitigation measures. I do believe, I mean, another issue is that um, and people do fatigue. It's very hard to observe social distancing day in, day out, week in, week out. We're here in week number, I've lost track in New York, uh, maybe <laughs> week number five or six. And it's very, it's easy to get fatigued and so on. And that's why the consistency of the message is so important. So that the scientists and the public health people are saying the same thing as the politicians and the business people. And because we have to do it all together because it is not easy. And it's, it's actually much harder for vulnerable populations like poor people and so on. So we have to support each other and be consistent in order to, to actually hopefully see the end of this uh, epidemic. Thank you. Yeah, consistency is something that it's not <laughs> happening in Brazil right now. Yeah. So um, another question for Sylvia. Sylvia, um, you presented, you talked a little bit about um, the Visible of physical distancing and the difficulty to uh, distancing in overcrowded areas like favelas, for example. So, uh, could you mention, or is there any alternative or supportive strategy uh, that could help the Brazilian experience? Something that we could could be offered for Brazil. So what I know, what I know that is being done already in the favela of Paraisópolis in São Paulo is that they they created a separate area, a separate area where people with symptoms would go there and stay uh, and stay there while they're sick instead of say, staying like uh, 
instead of sharing like one, uh, one room ha uh, one room home with uh, all their other household members. The other, the other, um, I think the other option would be something that has been done in, in that has been done in China is that even mild cases should go to the hospitals to the uh, makeshift hospitals that are being built now, for example, in stadiums both in Sao Paulo and in Rio and in other cities. So that, that is, I think that is the best, the, uh, that, that, that would be one of the best things to do like once, once people start being symptomatic. The other thing is like, uh, if people still have to go to work, like have, uh, still have to go to work or are essential workers, like uh, ha have people entering, 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 going to work in staggered, staggered hours staggered hours, uh, uh, avoiding overcrowding of the buses and, and the subway, which I know is hard. Like even here, even here with essential workers, sometimes, sometimes the, the subway here is crowded because they, they don't have that many, that many subways running, but, uh, and also getting, getting, getting support from the civil society and getting support from the civil society in form of donations and from the government. Thank you. Um, Tom, would you like to um, address some questions or should they go? Maybe the time is just about up on it, but um, I guess it, one question maybe for you, Sylvia, and then one for you, Wafa, or you can change the order if you'd like it. Sylvia, there was some hope in Brazil, hope rather than, I think, science, that warm weather was a factor oh. uh, in the beginning. So I wondered what you could address the issue of, of warm weather I, um, uh, and the spread. And then Wafa, for you, this sort of this race for the vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, which I know is going on worldwide. Uh, it's really more a question for the virologist, but you certainly follow that question carefully as well. So maybe you, we can finish, maybe if you, if you don't mind, Sylvia, first with you and then turn uh, yeah. to Wafa. So I think the question about warm weather, uh, people were hoping that the virus would wax and wane with warm weather, but what we're seeing, not in the Northeast region of Brazil and the North, and then in the North of Brazil is equivalent to all, what, we are, what we saw, for example, in Singapore, it seems the virus still spreads That's when it's warm. Yeah. So, but Wafa is the infectious disease, <laughs> infectious epidemiologist expert. Like I'm an expert on Brazil and on other, on, on other, on other areas, but Wafa, Wafa might want to add onto that, on top of that. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some data, sort of experimental laboratory data that do show that, the, that viruses like this one, the data has not been done for this virus, but viruses like this, they tend to be less stable in hot, humid environments. Um, so that they kind of like to be in cold, dry environment. So there was hope that maybe we'll see the same phenomenon with this virus that with the warming of the, you know, with the warming weather in the global north, uh, that then you would see less cases. Of course, that hasn't happened in the US. If you look at Florida, for example, which was one of the hotspots in that map that I showed you in New Orleans. These are pretty warm areas in this country and they, they are experiencing hotspots now. So it's unclear the, by itself, you, you, you never, never, never depend on the hope that the weather will make a difference. You have to do all the hard work to do the other uh, containment and mitigation work. Um, right. And then the question about vaccines, I think there's a, there's really a race now for two things, a race to find treatment and a race to find a vaccine. And why is it important? I mean, this virus is very highly transmissible. Uh, that's true. Uh, so is influenza. It's also highly transmissible influenza. But the good thing is that with influenza, we do have a vaccine and we also have a treatment, an antiviral treatment, a pill that people can take. So I think that makes a huge difference. And while with the SARS-CoV-2, this virus, we have neither treatment nor a vaccine. And we know from the mortality data is that this virus appears to have much higher mortality than influenza does. So I think that's a great concern. And that's why there's a race to find a treatment for people who are sick so we can save lives uh, with treatment. And there are several medications that are now in clinical trials uh, to try to find um, an effective antiviral. Uh, too early to have any data, any definitive data. At the same time, there's also a race to identify vaccines or other preventive methods like uh, 
And actually there's one vaccine that's already in human trials. Mm -hmm. uh, they've already started injecting human beings, uh, volunteers, healthy volunteers, to determine the safety first in a small number of uh, healthy volunteers. And then you move from this phase one to phase two, where you use, where you test the virus, or where you test the vaccine in the larger group of individuals and you're looking both at safety as well as the efficacy. Is it gonna work or not? Uh, there also is work, very interesting work, looking at what are called monoclonal antibodies as almost like a vaccine. These are, you know, when somebody gets infected, like a convalescent person, um, the hope is that if you isolate or you create, now they're able to create these antibodies in the laboratory and if these antibodies can be shown to be effective in the lab against this virus, then maybe if we can infuse uh, people uh, with these, anti these monoclonal antibodies, that that may also hopefully prevent um, the disease. But uh, the research is very early. There's nothing that's been done yet in human beings. There's the hope that human studies will start sometime in mid-May uh, with these monoclonal antibodies. Well, with that, I'm going to turn things back to Laura, but I add my personal thanks uh, for these wonderful remarks to you, Wapa, to you, Sylvia, and those of us who joined us in Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Laura, over to you then to <laughs> our evening. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Uh, Sylvia, Wafa, was amazing to hear from you guys. Um, I wanted to let you all know that the Columbia Global Center in Rio has been promoting these webinars weekly. Uh, so please follow us on social media. Um, we are always doing our best to connect our audience with uh, experts from Columbia universities, such as Sylvia and Wafa. So thank you and have a good night. Stay at home and take care. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thanks for the Bye -bye. opportunity. Bye-bye.